thank you very much uh, for, for those warm introductions. Um, it's great to be in Teeswater. Um, second time for me, uh, great town. Um, I really appreciated those introductions um, for a number of reasons, but one is you know, a statement of you know, conflict of interest or bias. And you know, whenever we have a medical conference, we start off that way. Um, I think there's often a common perception that everyone has a bias except for you know, <laughs> myself. Um, but that is important. And um, you know, as introduced as an ER physician, um, I, I'm also, uh, I, I do medical simulation training, um, but I am also the president of a nonprofit which is called Canadians for Nuclear Energy. So clearly there is a bias here. Um, I hope to explain that. Um, you know, and I encourage everybody here to be skeptical, as you should be really of, of any opinion um, that you're, you're, you're faced with. And we're going to have an opportunity for, you know, questions and answer later on in the talk, and I really welcome that. You know, one of the great harms of the COVID pandemic has been that we haven't been able to be in person very much, and we kind of retreat to social media, and social media is a cesspool. Right? I think it's just so easy to infer the worst possible intentions of anyone that you get in a disagreement with. There's no body language, uh, there's no opportunity um, to sort of get to know the person and get a sense anyway of you know, their values, what kind of person they are. Um, so I'm, I'm really glad and, and, and honored to be here uh, in person. Just to clarify a few other things, um, you know, in terms of this conflict of interest statement, um, I have absolutely zero financial conflict. All my income is from OHIP, <laughs> from your taxes, so thank you very much. Um, I have no relationship to the NWMO, um, you know, this is being hosted by Willing to Listen, but just, just to make that clear, I am the president again of Canadians for Nuclear Energy, which is a group of scientists, doctors, engineers, environmentalists, and policy experts who believe that nuclear energy must be a core part of Canada's energy transition. And you can find our website at C4NE, that's four as a number sign, dot CA. Um, you know, another conflict of interest, um, you know, this is a kind of a personal one, but my, my dad's cancer is being treated with a medical isotope um, that's starting to be produced at Bruce Power. Um, you know, it's just more sort of, a, I don't know, I, I don't know whether even to bring it up, but, but it is something that, that's there. Um, okay, so, Again, it's hard to attract physicians to tease water. It's hard to attract physicians to many small communities. So what are a bunch of doctors doing here today? Why have I come here? You know, what are my motivations? I think those are very fair questions uh, to be asking. Um, you know, clearly, I've become very passionate about this issue. Um, I have a kind of lifelong history of, of social activism. Um, previously, you know, I founded one of Canada's first migrant worker health clinics to serve the Mexican and Jamaican workers that come up and produce a lot of our food down in Simcoe County. I was a consulting physician at the Canadian Centre for Victims of Torture. Uh, I was a health columnist in Canada's largest circulating Indigenous-owned newspaper. Um, did I ever expect myself to be in Teeswater talking to you all about nuclear or to be you know, passionate about it as an issue? Definitely not. So. You know, again, why am I here? That, that passion and also, you know, I have a girlfriend that lets me, you know, waste our weekends. No, no, let's, let's, let's come up here. So. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean waste the weekend, but she lets me get away with this kind of stuff uh, on a free weekend. So uh, they don't happen that often and, and wanted to show some appreciation there. Um, okay, so I wanted to chat a little bit of, again about, about bias and, you know, why I have the positions that I do around nuclear, and then I definitely want to touch on uh, the issue of the DGR um, and what the risks as I perceive them are and, and are not. Um, so again, just, just a little bit more around you know, where I'm coming from. Um, I have a four-year-old son around the time of his birth. Uh, I started thinking, as I think many parents do these days, about climate change, about what the future is going to look like. It's, you, know, you mentioned sort of nuclear weapons being the big issue um, of, say, my, my parents' generation, and climate change has become you know, a big issue in terms of what are the threats to our future. We always think about that, I think, when we bring a child into the world. So it got me very interested in climate change, and I very quickly came to the conclusion that to understand what the solutions are, one really needs to study energy. It's, it's about transitioning from fossil fuels to, to clean energy. Um, and in terms of looking at what's worked around the world, 
You know, in medicine, we talk a lot about evidence-based medicine. We need to read the studies critically, see if the methodology was good, um, and draw our conclusions in that way rather than other potential biases. Um, and, you know, I learned that there's large, nine large economies of over 500 million people that have achieved what we call sort of the gold standard of a deeply decarbonized electricity grid. Um, and all of them are either blessed with hydro, like, say, Quebec, where, you know, 98% of their electricity is from hydroelectricity, or a combination of nuclear and something else, usually nuclear and hydro. Um, and when doing further research, I said, wow, this is interesting. Ontario has kind of achieved that holy grail of a low carbon grid, which is excellent. It's just the beginning because we need to grow that grid in order to power the rest of society and you know, move away from fossil fuels. Again, as a physician, I, I started practicing in the early 2000s. Um, and that was at the beginning of our coal phase out here. Um, you know, Toronto used to be called the Big Smoke. There were 54 smog days a year. I had a friend growing up uh, with asthma who barely ever went outside uh, because of how bad the air was. Um, and I came to understand and realize through my research that nuclear energy in Ontario had provided 90% of the energy required to completely phase out coal. The Ontario Medical Association um, made some, you know, did some modeling and estimates um, at the beginning of the coal phase out on the burden of air pollution. Uh, they, they estimated that there were 1,900 premature deaths every single year as a result of air pollution, and a big chunk of that was coal, uh, 9,800 hospital admissions, and 13,000 ER visits. Now, anecdotally in my practice, I have noticed a real change in terms of the burden of respiratory illness. Um, and that's, you know, we always need to be cautious in medicine about what we call anecdote. You know, that's not the strongest level of evidence. You know, as we've learned from COVID, you have to be very skeptical because there's all kinds of ideas out there. Science says this, you know, study says that. Um, you know, anecdote's not strong, but certainly that's something I noticed. So that's, that's a kind of another link that I have. And then again, lastly, in terms of kind of arriving at the conclusions that I've, I've come to, um, the issue of medical isotopes is, is a really big one. Um, so our CANDU technology um, produces just an enormous amount of the world's medical isotopes. 40% uh, of the world's single-use medical instruments are sterile thanks to that cobalt-60 that is produced, again, in massive quantities um, in our unique reactor design. Other reactors around the world can't do this, and you know, we have other ways of making medical isotopes, but they don't produce the kind of volumes that, that our power reactors do. Um, and that really means that, you know, modern healthcare is enabled by, by those medical isotopes. You know, when you get your blood drawn, the syringe, the blood tube, um, the PPE, um, if you get your joint replaced, um, you know, almost anything that would melt at high temperatures, like in an autoclave, needs to be sterilized some way, and medical isotopes are really the way we do that. So I guess enough about introducing myself um, and, and sharing that source of bias. Um, I want to talk a little bit about spent nuclear fuel now or nuclear waste. There's many ways to refer to it. Um, and some of my opinions uh, about the DGR. And again, I want to recognize that there are a wide range of opinions. You'll find other doctors that will say very different things than me. So again, be skeptical of me, be skeptical of them, be skeptical of everyone. Um, there is no denying that spent nuclear fuel is incredibly dangerous, particularly as it leaves the reactor. If it's not shielded and you spend less than a minute within a meter or two of it, it's a death sentence, right? So it's worthy of respect um, and it is dangerous, unshielded. There's kind of an irony where things that are dangerous end up being safe. And I wanna explain that with an analogy to aviation. Right, like a lot of, I don't know, has anyone here flown across the Atlantic? Or gone, you know, probably a bunch of us. We live in unusual times where we can, you know, do these kind of big trips. But I mean, you're flying in a very thin, you know, metal or carbon fiber tube, pressurized 30,000 feet or 10 kilometers above the surface of the earth. Not quite the speed of sound, but pretty close. And we're flying over oceans with nowhere to land for thousands of kilometers. And most of us don't give it a second thought. That is objectively incredibly dangerous to do, but you know, human ingenuity has gone into engineering incredible quality control, um, learning from problems that have occurred before, including things like accidents, and we've made it safer than driving. Okay, it's still not perfect. There's still you know, a few hundred people every year that die in aviation. So waste, again, is dangerous when it comes out of the reactor. Um, we shield it, 
you know, it's put into a spent fuel pool where the water shields it, and then it's put into dry cast storage where concrete and steel shields it. In a sense, that's a lot simpler of, of, of engineering than making, you know, transcontinental aviation safe. So again, there's a difference between something that's really dangerous and the degree of risk that it poses. And you know, when I went looking and others have gone looking for any instance of, you know, in the 60 years of civilian nuclear power, has there ever been a death associated with storing spent nuclear fuel or nuclear waste? And there, there's, there's not, you can't find a single one, which is pretty extraordinary because nuclear waste is this kind of bogeyman. Um, we're told there's no solution for, it's very dangerous. It is dangerous, but we've learned how to manage it very, very well. That danger, of course, also decreases over time. I'm not going to cut into Douglas's stuff here because he's really the scientist and expert on this, and we'll probably talk to you a little bit about half-lives and you know people worry a lot because, God, this stuff is radioactive for hundreds of millions of years. We've got to look after it carefully for that amount of time. I think Douglas is going to touch on that. You know, Suffice it to say, potassium has a radioactive isotope that's present in our bodies. Half-life's two billion years, is it? Yeah. And, and we get 4,600 decays of that atom every single second in our body. And potassium is the number one positively charged ion inside of our cells. So it's all around our DNA. Radiation is everywhere. Douglas, again, is going to touch, or Dr. Borhan yeah. is going to touch on that <laughs> in, a, in a lot more detail. Um, so in t again, in terms of this concept of forever waste, um, nuclear waste goes from being something that you know, will kill you within seconds if it's unshielded out of the reactor to something that in a thousand years you can hold in your hand. And the way that it would harm you at that point is you'd have to pulverize it and find some way to get it into your body, breathing it in, eating it, drinking it, something like that. So I want to talk a little bit about the DGR. I'm not a, you know, like the, the NWMO, I've, I, I, again, I have no, I don't work for them. They don't pay me to do anything. I've gone, you know, as a kind of journalist to ask them questions and, and to learn. Um, and I've studied some of the, the documents that they reference. But I want to talk quickly, in medicine we talk a little about the, the, the mechanism of action of a medication. How does it work in the body? And I want to talk a bit about the mechanism of action for the nuclear waste, or what we call the radionuclides, to escape the deep geologic repository. So essentially, again, as I was saying, the danger is if this stuff gets ingested into your body somehow. So how, how does it escape from the DGR? And again, I'm not going to go too much into the engineering barriers and stuff like that, but essentially water needs to get in and dissolve the fuel. And, and again, the fuel is, is a ceramic. You could think of it kind of like a coffee cup. Not, not easy to dissolve. And you know, I don't want to get into the chemistry too much, but things don't dissolve well at all when there's no oxygen in the environment. And down there, there's really no oxygen or O2. So just kind of working through some of those barriers, water has to first of all move through the rock. And part of you know, the reason why they're looking in this area is the rock is extraordinary. It takes a million years for water to move through that rock, sorry, to move one meter through that rock. That's, that's called hydraulic conductance. It's the characteristic of the rock, and I know people go, it's limestone. Like, I've seen the limestone up, uh, up, you know, up on the Bruce Peninsula. It's full of caves and stuff like that. It's, it's a very different formation deep under our feet right now. Water needs to move through there. It needs to move through this bentonite clay, which is one of the most absorbent forms of clay. You know, we use it, we don't, we use clay in like landfills to prevent water from seeping through. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty uh, difficult material for water to move through. Um, needs to get through these copper line steel canisters, which again, don't corrode well at all in an oxygen-free environment. Needs to get through there, get through the, the zirconium alloy sheets, which are again, not particularly corrosive and then needs to dissolve that fuel pellet. And then it needs to get back out the way it came, and then it needs to get back through the rock and move hundreds of meters, which again, it takes a million years to move a meter. So when I learned, particularly about the rock part of things, like a lot of my anxieties were, were diminished uh, because it's, it's a pretty extraordinary barrier. I wanna talk just briefly, and let me just check the time because I don't wanna talk too long. I wanna leave a lot of time for questions with you guys, but um, it's very interesting, you know, I'm, I'm in medicine, I've spent a lot of time talking to people, you know, at the NWMO, within the nuclear industry, et cetera, environmentalists, Green Party people, I've tried to really talk to a lot of different people. And I think, you know, you're, re you're referencing the Simpsons earlier, our perception of people, you know, of 
radio biologists, of you know, dosimetry experts, um, of people who, who work in the sector, it's pretty tainted by the kind of Mr. Burns um, archetype. And this kind of misperception I'm referring to is you know, the ways in which I think a lot of the public, and particularly people who are skeptical about nuclear, think about you know, these experts. And you know, they must be cutting some corners, they must be really biased. Um, many of them are, are pro-nuclear energy. I don't, want to, I don't want to say they're not having biases, but the degree to which they, like it, to me it's almost a bit pathological, the, the degree to which they um, will, let me just think about this carefully, the, the way that they will plan um, and try and diminish risks to a level that are so infinitesimally low and then say that's not good enough, we're gonna engineer it even better. Like the response to social criticisms or concerns is never like education, like what I'm trying to do today. It's more around, okay, well, we're gonna go back to the drawing board and engineer this lining so it's even better, right? And, and there's a kind of, there's something that's kind of admirable about that in terms of a culture of excellence. There's also something a little bit crazy about it. And it's very understandable, you know, when you have someone whose whole job is, you know, copper corrosion, this has got to last a million plus years, that the general public goes, what the hell are you putting inside these canisters? You know, you must be really worried about it if you're doing this, this, that, and the other, right? Anyway, I, I had a chance to talk with the safety modelers at the NWMO and chat with them about worst case scenarios and dose, because I think that's really important is understanding what are the implications. To understand the health implications, you gotta understand doses, right? And so their worst case scenario is called like an all canister failure scenario, right? They make, again, they disadvantage themselves a lot in terms of trying to maximize the dose to a theoretical person who lives right at the site of the DGR, digs a well there, waters the garden and eats only out of the garden, and eats only livestock from that site, spends every minute of their entire lives there, et cetera. Like they're really trying to make it kind of as bad as it could be. They also, so they have this assumption that the casts all fail. Rather than the cask failing, which might be like, you know, a well that's got a defect in water moving in, they just say, you know what, we're just gonna pretend there are no casks and we're gonna say that happens right away, which is again is a bit preposterous. But again, it shows you the kind of ways in which they try and increase the dose to, theoretically in order to reduce this risk to infinitesimally low levels. They also assume there's a really big geologic fault that they haven't picked up with their seismic studies and boreholes. And lastly, they assume that through the digging, you know, you lose the geological architecture, there's some kind of a collapse and the geology is disrupted. In that setting, what they anticipate the maximum dose would be is 40 nanosieverts of radiation annually per year to that person, again, living in that spot. I went through all the details there. To give you context, um, a banana is 98 nanosieverts. Again, and that's that potassium I was talking about in your body. So this, if you were to cut it up into 365 pieces and eat it over a year, is what would happen in that worst case scenario. And again, I encourage you guys to be skeptical. Really, is that the worst case scenario? I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty extraordinary, again, you know, the idea that this is called the cask failure, but actually they just model it with no casks, right? They also assume that the radionuclides leaving don't stick to the rock on their way out, which they do. So there's all, all sorts of ways. And again, I think that, that, that way of, of approaching the issue, if I were critical of the NWMO, is that it scares people a little bit because, again, of the, the ways in which you know, I might perceive they're almost over-engineering things. Anyway, that, that's, that's a, an opinion I have. Um, I'm going to close up really soon because Doug's got some really great material here. But I wanted to, you know, for the physicians in the group, I wanted to talk about looking at waste on a bit of a different angle. And I wanted to bring up a button battery. You guys have all seen a button battery before, I imagine, like in your calculator or whatever else. Button batteries are a huge waste problem. They're the scourge of the pediatric emergency room physician. Um, I've seen a few cases, they're, they're messy. Unlike nuclear waste, you can take a button battery fresh out of your, your calculator and hold it in your hand. It's not gonna kill you but it, it looks like a Smarty. And kids pick these things up all the time and they eat them, right? What they do is they move down your esophagus, they usually kind of stop there, and the, essentially what happens is you get a very basic environment um, at the negative pole of the battery, 
um, and that actually melts your esophagus and the battery can erode into your aorta, for instance, and the child can bleed to death or it can fistulize to the trachea, um, other very, very important structures that the esophagus touches. So this is a waste stream that's incredibly poorly managed. I'm just kind of trying to set this up as a bit of an opposite, right? We were talking about how waste is, is so dangerous comparing it to aviation. You know, dangerous things are often managed very well and become safe as a result. This is something that's kind of not dangerous, but because of the way we mismanage that waste stream, it's incredibly dangerous. And there's about 2,800 kids that are hospitalized annually in the US because of button battery ingestions. You know, when, it, when a kid comes in with a button battery ingestion, the clock's ticking. I've got a few hours to get the, uh, the GI guy in with a scope to, to get that button battery out. Okay, I wanna just close by making another kind of medical uh, allegory here. Medicine is all about weighing the benefits and risks and informed consent. What I hope I've given you, the context I've given you today, I hope is that I think there are reasons to be opposed to the DGR. I'm, I'm a country boy. I grew up in Aramosa County. I have a real sense of attachment to you know the farm I grew up next to. I used to fish back there, hunt back there, do all kinds of things back there. I understand that impulse towards like, yeah, not, not in my backyard. That's, that's a valid frame, I think, through which to see this. I imagine digging a huge hole in the ground is, you know, and excavating is going to be a, a bunch of traffic on your roads. Um, I think those are valid reasons to be concerned about the DGR. I hope it, with what I've shared to you today in terms of this, this some education about uh, radiation and about worst case scenarios, et cetera, that I've hopefully lowered the idea that radiation is the main reason to be opposed to this project. Again, am I invested in this? Do I care if it goes forward or not? Honestly, I think we do need a long-term solution um, and it would be a good thing to have that. Um, so, I mean, th there's kind of my, my statement of bias. Ultimately, again, the decision lies uh, in your hands and in the people of the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation. Um, so I'll leave it there, but, you know, I hope again that I've given you some tools to, to weigh those benefits and risks, you know, before giving or not giving your informed consent for, for this project. Thank you guys very much.